Well, guess what? Um, you're, in, you're in for part two of the sermon from last week. Uh, it's kind of like a continuation of what we started. Uh, I didn't really intend for it to work out this way. Um, I knew we were going to be jumping in the book of Acts, which is, it comes after the Gospels. It's written by Luke, as many of you know, details the explosion of Christ's church after he resurrects and ascends to heaven. But I was thrilled to see how God would, would bring this all together. And, and it makes sense because God often works that way, right? He has a way of revealing some pretty neat things to you when, when you're not expecting it, and, which is what happened to me. So last week, I'm, I'm on my way home, and I'm just all of a sudden, just the mind started getting flooded with thoughts of like, what I'm going to say, and what, I, what do I need to share from Acts, and it was just really cool how it all came together. So I know this is our, our second week of worship together, but I believe we've, we've been on the same page for the last probably month or so. I, I believe Pastor David probably took you through... Uh, the triumphal entry of Jesus, his death and burial and his resurrection as we, we celebrated Easter. Uh, the resurrection, right? Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. We, we have a risen Savior. So last week, the message was, so now what? Christ is risen. What, what are we going to do? How should we now live? Uh, now that we know the King who has all authority... He defeated sin and death, and he offers to rescue this dying world through the good news of the gospel. You then live boldly, and you live intentionally, and you live confidently. And Jesus uh, was with the disciples. He spent 40 days with them, and then he made a post-resurrection appearance, appearances to over 500 witnesses. And I was encouraged by Joan Dan last week. She said that was one of her favorite Bible verses, and it's underlined in her Bible that many people forget that it wasn't just a few disparate people that, that noticed and found Jesus after the resurrection. He, he, was, he appeared to over 500 different people so we can have great confidence that, that he truly was resurrected. But Jesus kept reminding the disciples that he wasn't going to stick around. He was going to go away. Any, anyone wishing Jesus would still walk in the earth with us? would be kind of cool, right? Yes. And, and he knew that they would be troubled. And that you can understand the difficulties to, to have Christ depart from you. Right? It was pretty cool to have him around, I would think. You know, you get a, a front row seat to seeing people getting healed and demons being casted out, bread and wine multiplying. So what would happen to the disciples now that Jesus was going away? How could people still know and follow Jesus? And that's a good question. If Jesus goes away... How can we know and follow him? And for that reason, we're going to jump into the book of Acts. Jesus said he was going to do something. He, he said he was going to give you something. And it's something that you and I need. Let's jump into Acts here. Is it uh, working here? I think we lost our... Uh, can you... There it is. So he said this, And while they were gathered together, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift the Father promised, which you have heard me discuss. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So my message for today is really this. You need the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to give you three reasons why. And this is not all the reasons why you need the Holy Spirit. We, we could exhaust ourselves here if we, we tried to cover that. But the first is, you need the Holy Spirit to know God. Jesus said the disciples needed the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Does it sound kind of weird? Does it sound a little strange to your ears? Well, it's not. It is supernatural, after all, though we are dealing with God, but it's not as strange or as unusual as it sounds. Maybe some of you are thinking of the old the King James Version of the Bible where it says, the Holy Ghost, you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Maybe some of you are in here thinking, like, I, I, don't, want any, I don't want anything to do with any ghosts anywhere near me at all. But, but we need to know and understand that this, this means God's Spirit, right? It comes, comes from a Greek word, pneuma. 
which, which can be translated spirit or wind or breath, it really just means this, that you need an outpouring of God's spirit within you that presumably you don't have until God pours it out. God literally breathes into you, just as he did for Adam when he created the first man. Physically, he says he formed the man from the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. Adam came to life physically by God breathing life into his physical body. We need, we need to come to life spiritually by God breathing his spirit into us. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit birth. And you know what God is doing when he baptizes you in the Holy Spirit? You might think it's weird, it just seems odd, it sounds like some spiritual gibberish. But here's what God is doing when he baptizes you in the Holy Spirit. It means he literally is sending himself, his own spirit, to live and dwell within you. You now have God living and residing within you. Always, always, right? Remember last week, Matthew said, and I am with you always, and it will never be taken from you. The Holy Spirit will never be taken from you. God will never leave you or forsake you. That is the promise of the Holy Spirit living and dwelling within us. And we know as Christians, we worship the triune God, the, the God who is one, three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're not three separate gods. God is made up of one one uh, in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So when Jesus says, I'm going away and I'm going to give you a helper, I'm going to give you a comforter and, and the counselor, he's saying, I'm, I'm going to send God to you to fill you. Anyone want to be filled with God? Yes. Anyone want God to live and dwell within them? Yes. Amen. I know I do. So don't miss this. And here's the reality. I don't think the world knows this, that the Holy Spirit isn't just for some people. The Holy Spirit is not just for some people, because if you want to know God, the Holy Spirit is for you. Right. You need the Holy Spirit to know God. Mm -hmm. We need the baptism in the Holy Spirit to know God. This, this is an amazing thing. Man can't produce it. Man can't earn it. This is the exact same idea that Jesus told Nicodemus. So he said, you must be born again. You must receive the Holy Spirit. You must be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And you know how you receive it? Simply by believing, by faith, by believing. If you don't believe Christ, if you don't believe what he says, why then would he give you the gift and the blessing of the Holy Spirit to live and dwell within you? If you don't believe him, it will not happen. In fact, that's the only unforgivable sin in the Bible it means that you didn't believe Jesus, you didn't believe his word, and you didn't believe the work of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, you couldn't receive the Holy Spirit. But I, I bet you can't fathom it, right? It sounds too good to be true. Forgiven of everything. A right standing with God. On your way to heaven with Christ to be forever and to top it off, his presence is now going to live and indwell within you forever. Uh, there's not much better that can be offered. This, this is better than a lottery. Yeah. This is better than all the gold combined in the world. It doesn't compare. I remember years ago as a young Christian, I was actually attending Midland E Free, and I was involved in a young, young adults group at the time. And I was really close with about three other guys. We're, about, we're all 18 to 20 years old. We used to meet regularly to get together to pray, read the scriptures. And I remember one study we had and, and the comment was made about how blessed the disciples were because they got to live with Jesus and see Jesus face to face, you know, in person. And they got the comfort and the power of his presence face to face. And everyone was kind of in agreement that um, it couldn't get, couldn't get much better than that. Well, one of our friends who seemed to be very quiet, he typically didn't say much. But when he spoke, you better listen because he's about to say something profound. And so that's what happened this time. We're all saying how great it would be. Man, I just want to, I wish I was with Jesus physically. But then he opened his mouth and he said, well, how much better if Jesus Christ lives inside of you? And we're all like, whoa, that's, that's mind-blowing. Like, where is, is he going to do that? Yeah, he's going to do that, right? That's what, that's what, now don't get me wrong. 
I think it would be best to have both, best of both worlds. I would have loved to see Jesus in person, face to face, but then when he goes away, okay, send me the Holy Spirit and live and reside within me. That sounds great, but, but you can't get any closer to God when you have the Holy Spirit living within you. It's a beautiful thing that only God, only God could have orchestrated such a thing. And I love that. That's what's different with Christianity and the rest of the world religions. All these other world religions, God is, he's transcendent. He's different. He's just away from you. You can't get close to him. The God of the Bible, the Christian God says, I'm going to come and live and dwell within you. He comes near to us. And here's another amazing thought. In, in the Old Testament times, before Jesus came, if you wanted to get close to God, where'd you have to go? You had to go to the temple. You had to go to the sanctuary, right? That's where, you, that's where you went to get close to God. But now, since Christ has risen, and he sent us the Holy Spirit, the scriptures now say that our bodies are the temple. God dwells within us through the Holy Spirit given to us. God doesn't dwell in temples made by human hands. He, he lives within his people. And how much more when we all come together and as far as the power and the presence of God? 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20 says, Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit whom is in you and you've received from God? And we, when we come together as Christians, imagine the power and the presence of all of us coming together. I think something is powerfully happening there, right? More so than when we're just alone. And that's why it's so important that we meet regularly, that we, and I would say even just Sundays, probably not enough. Meeting once a week is it's like life support. You're on life support. That's it. You're just, you're just maintaining. You, you probably heard that saying, that quote, that a, a week without prayer makes someone weak. Yeah. What is that, a homonym or a homo? I don't know what they are. Girls, do you know? It's where a word is, it sounds the same, but it's spelled different. A week without prayer, as in length of time, is going to make someone weak, as in I have no strength. But a week without prayer can make someone weak. A, a week without truth can make you weak. A week without worship, a week without the fellowship of believers and coming together will make us weak. So instead, we, may we regularly gather and dwell by the Holy Spirit, that even more we'll experience the fanning of the flame of the Holy Spirit of God within the church. Amen? So let's meet together. Let's be together. Let's pray for one another. The baptism of the Holy Spirit gives us life. The Spirit brings you truth about Christ. It convicts you about the truth about Christ. And it convinces you about the truth about Christ. The Holy Spirit convinces you to believe in, to follow Jesus. So when you do put your faith in Christ, we know this is the work of the Holy Spirit. He opens your eyes. He opens your ears. As it says in 1 Corinthians no one can say Jesus Christ is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. No one's going to be like, yeah, Jesus Christ is my Lord unless the Holy Spirit is, is working in your life. You need the Holy Spirit to know God. There's no other way. There's no other way. But you need the Holy Spirit to be directed by God. We need the Holy Spirit to be directed by God, to be guided in God's plans and purposes for our lives. You won't find, you won't know, and you won't follow God's will apart from the Spirit of God. But now you have the Holy Spirit. You can accomplish God's mission and purpose from your life, which we talked about last week. What is the purpose for us as Christians? We get this from Matthew 28, to make disciples and to join in the work that Jesus is doing to advance his name and kingdom throughout the earth. And here in Acts, this is this complementary text to the Great Commission. I think this is a Great Commission just stated in another way in another book. It says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He says that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and, and to the ends of the earth. If we are followers of Jesus, this is God's mission and purpose for you and I. This, this is for the church across, this is for the church across the globe. But we're not going to know it, and we're not going to do it apart from the Holy Spirit directing us. Do you know the plans and purposes that God has for your life? If you're a Christian, you know that you're called to be an ambassador in this world. 
an ambassador? You're like, oh, that sounds really cool. You know, I, I'd like to be part of a royal family. Mm. Well, you are. Right. You're sons and daughters of the king of the universe. Right. But here on earth, while we're here, we're, we're called to be ambassadors. Paul put it this way to the Corinthians. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. It's the Holy Spirit work. You've been born again, born anew. Baptized in the Holy Spirit. This is all from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. There's your purpose in, for life. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's trespasses against them. And he, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making his appeal through us, the church, believers. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Dictionary definition of an ambassador is an official representative one of one country, country or organization appointed to represent its interests and foster diplomatic relations with another country or organization. Do you see your role and your purpose now? Think about it. You're an ambassador for Christ. This world is not your home. Your citizenship is in heaven. We're, we're temporarily stationed here as foreigners and strangers to engage with this other world that we find ourselves in, to represent the interest and to communicate the truth about the king of the universe so that people may have a new diplomatic relationship with God, reconciled to him through Christ. And that's us. We're, he's going to use us. That's our purpose. He has, he has no other plan. He has no other plan to advance his name and his kingdom. He's going to use us, but we're not going to know it. We won't care, and we won't follow him in his direction for our lives, apart from the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, uh, he told the disciples that their mission was to go to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and all the ends of the earth. Well, we're not over there, and right now it might not be a good time to be over there. We're not over in Jerusalem, but that's, that's okay because Jerusalem, that's our midland for us, right? That's our hometown. We're called to be ambassadors here. Judea and Samaria, that's like, Saginaw Bay area maybe, or perhaps across the state, across the country, and, and of course to the ends of the earth. That's every tribe, tongue, and nation as quoted from Matthew 28. The church is called to be ambassadors everywhere. We multiply and we spread and we fill the earth, and, 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 I, and I think that's exciting. Right now we, we have wars in the Middle East as we speak. But we wouldn't if everyone there knew King Jesus. Right. Thought about that? Yeah. We need to be praying for God to work mightily among the peoples in the Middle East, that they no longer would be deceived, that they no longer would be held captive by religious lies, and instead made new and set free by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. That's what's going on. Yeah. Uh, pray, pray for that situation, but... There's no, no country is going to solve that problem. Only, only King Jesus can, can solve the, the, ultimately solve that problem. So God's plan and will for you is to love and worship Jesus, is to encourage others to do the same. That's pretty simple, right? My, my, God's calling me to love and worship Jesus and encourage others to do the same. And if you're a Christ follower, God's will and purpose for you is that you seek the king and his kingdom advancing across the earth. And you need the Holy Spirit to do it, to desire it, Right? And when you do, when you surrender your life to believe in Christ and you submit to his plans to direct your life, to be guided by the Holy Spirit, you are going to experience the power of God in your life. And others will too. This is, this is not fake. This is, he's speaking the truth. Sometimes we don't, we don't feel that, though. We don't feel or sense the power of God, but maybe it's we're not seeking his presence enough. Maybe we're not abiding in him and his word enough. I don't know what it is, but I believe it. He said it. There's power, power in the Holy Spirit. I want to live that life, and I want to experience God's power and presence. We need the Holy Spirit to experience the power of God. That's exactly what, uh, what follows when Jesus tells the disciples, hang out here, and stay in Jerusalem, and wait till I send the Holy Spirit, and, and then watch what happens when, when Jesus sends the Holy Spirit. 
to the disciples on this day commonly known as Pentecost, the sending of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2 says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a mighty rushing wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in, in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were, now there were dwelling in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when this sound rang out, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one had heard them speak in his own language. Astounded and amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? How is it then that each of us hears them in, in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, and Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, all these different people, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. This is an interesting passage right here, isn't it? Pentecost? Seems like some kind of strange sci-fi movie scene or something. Something strange going on, but it's not something you see on your everyday commute to work, I don't think. A mighty rushing wind coming down from heaven, tongues like flames of fires that came to rest upon them. But this passage, though, is really clear what the Holy Spirit was going to enable them to do by the Holy Spirit power. And that is to speak in the native tongues of all the peoples and all the nations that were there that day. It's a miracle. I don't know about you. But I've tried to learn some foreign languages. I have a few of them. I try to pick up a few words and phrases here and there. And, uh, but my dull mind forgets it after about two minutes. And I was going to ask uh, Claire, who's back from Costa Rica. She's been down there for eight months or so. Uh, how, how is your language learning going, right? I'm sure you wouldn't mind the miracle of where you become an expert in another world language in, in just in a moment's time. But... but in order to speak the truth of Christ, and that's exactly what, what happened here. So what were they communicating? It says they were bewildered. These people were, why? One, I think it's because all of a sudden these, these Greek gen, or these Greek speaking Jews were fluent in all these other languages. But even more, I think it was this, that they were bewildered, they were amazed because they were declaring the wonders of God. That's what an ambassador does. Empowered by the Holy Spirit within them, they declare the wonders of God. You and I are called to declare the wonders of God in such a way that it's unmistakably God who's at work within us. All these disciples spoke their native languages, and what was the response of these nations? It says they were bewildered, they were amazed, they were astounded. When people encounter Christians and they witness the power and the presence of God in someone's life, what will be their response? I think it's the same. They should be amazed, astounded. Unless, of course, they, they take the route of mockery, which some do if you read later in the rest of Acts chapter 2. Some people witness this, and, and, and they, they either are astonished and intrigued and drawn into it, or they will mock and sneer and move away from it. But this is the point. You need the Holy Spirit for God to work powerfully in your life and to do only what he can do. That's what happened to me. That's how I became a Christian. I know some of you have heard this story, especially at Damascus, but I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Uh, my freshman year, I went to Delta College, and I was in need of a job. I stopped into this disability services, and I was hired. I was, I was told that a man named Ed was going to be my first student, and, and uh, I was going to be taking notes for him, and that he was legally blind. Well, I was a little naive because I pretty much thought that he, that could, he couldn't see at all, which doesn't make a lot of sense because I was going to take notes for him and then he was going to read the notes. But as I approached this man, who from my understanding could, could barely see, the, the most valuable part of his body was failing him. And yet he had this aura and this joy, this peace about him, this light shining upon his face in a way that I would say none of these other teenagers around had. 
And that, and it nearly shocked me that he was like this. And I was thinking, how is he like this? Why is he like this? There's something different about him. And, and you know what, what, what it was, I believe, it was the power of the Holy Spirit within him. Mm. Enabling him in the midst of life's challenges and sufferings and tribulations to have peace and joy that nothing else could give you. Amen. He had a life about him that surpassed everyone in the room. And if you ask me, the only explanation is the power of the Holy Spirit. I think uh, it was that day that he shared the gospel with me. He shared about Jesus Christ, and, and, and I came to faith in Christ. God used the power of the Holy Spirit in him to draw me to the wonders of Christ. The Holy Spirit can heal us. The Holy Spirit can give us wisdom. He can comfort us. He can encourage us. He can give us words in a moment. Jesus said, don't worry about what you're going to say because I'm going to give you the words in the moment. He can guide us in our decisions. He, and he reveals the wonder of God to us. But most of all, and best of all, miraculously, he breathes his spirit into our dead, dry bones and brings us to, to life. These are all Holy Spirit-empowered things. We need the Holy Spirit for everything. To know God, to be directed by God, to experience the power of God. And as we do this, as we're baptized, filled by the Holy Spirit, as we witness concerning Him and we seek to make disciples, do you know what's going to happen? What's going to happen to a dying and hopeless world around us is this. They will find life in Him forever. People will be drawn to Christ by the demonstration of the Spirit's power in the believer's life and in the life of the church. That's the pattern. We see it here in Acts 2. <clears throat> This is often referred to uh, Peter's sermon. He's, he's reminding all the Jews what they've witnessed is simply a fulfillment of Scripture. They've witnessed the, all this, speaking in different tongues. And <clears throat> he said the prophet Joel foretold that this was going to happen. God said he's going to pour out his spirit on all, all people. Sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will, will see visions. Old men will dream dreams. God was going to show the wonders in the heavens and above and give signs on earth below and that everyone who calls on the name of Jesus would be saved. Mm. Here's Peter proclaiming the gospel, the good news that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God. Men of Israel, listen to this message. Jesus of Nazareth was man certified by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. He was delivered up by God's set plan and foreknowledge and you by the hands of the lawless, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, releasing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for him to be held in its clutches. Therefore, let all Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and asked Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And those who embraced his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the believers that day. You see what happens here at the, the end result of this? Salvation that more than 3,000 people were added to their numbers. And I believe this is what God wants to do in our lives and, and in the life of, of this church, that each of us know God by the Holy Spirit, that we're directed by God, we're surrendered to the Holy Spirit, and that God works powerfully in our lives and in, in our midst through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the end result is that other people being drawn and attracted to Christ, just as I was, by that man named Ed Tees who was filled by the Spirit. I saw the power and the presence of God in his life, and it, and it made me open. I was amazed. I was, I was, to use a word from the text, I was bewildered. And I needed to know how and why he was like that. And he gladly told me. Church, are you living by the power in the presence of the Holy Spirit? Are you so in tune with God in this life that as you're, as you're coming and going, we talked about last week, 
that people around you can sense and know that there's something different about you? Are they sitting there marveling as you declare to them the wonders of God? That the grace and mercy that is in Christ to rescue this dying world. Let's pray for revival. Let's pray for the Holy Spirit filling and leading us that we may live our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit in such a way that lost people are saved. Dead people are made alive by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Here's my hope and prayer. That new people, that more people, will be bewildered by Christ and his power and the good news of the gospel. And they will come to know him, and this cycle will repeat. Right? That, that God's going to get a hold of another. He's going to set them on the same path and plan that we have to be transformed by him, to be guided and directed by him, to do his will, to be ambassadors for him, to seek him and his kingdom, to be empowered to do things only he can do so that this cycle is on just a never-ending repeat until the glory of Christ fills the whole earth. Do you want to do things only God can do? Then, my friends, you need the Holy Spirit. Pray with me this morning for the Holy Spirit. God in heaven, thank you for your word. I thank you for this people who are gathered here this morning that you brought. Let's pray by your power and your grace and kindness that truly you would pour out the Holy Spirit. God, stir hearts now to come to you to pray and say, Oh Lord Jesus, give me the Holy Spirit. Come to live and dwell, reside within me that I may know you, that I may live my life for you and be directed and guided to do your will in heaven and on earth. And that your power and presence would live within me as I traverse this life as a sojourner in a fallen world. God, help us to know you, to experience your power, and may you draw more and more people to the goodness of our God, who's given us his son, Jesus Christ. It's in your name that we pray. Amen, church is all right. If you will, it's Sunday song, time to have fun.